Good morning, everybody, and or good afternoon, good evening, depending on your time zone. And thank you so much for sticking with us and joining us for the second day of Inc. 2020 annual workshop. Uh, we've had a great uh, presentation yesterday. Lots of people joined in, and I can see lots of people are joining in again today. So thank you so very much again for joining. Uh, we all we have a pretty interesting and packed agenda for 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 the day two. Um, we're going to start with thirty minutes of work group updates, and then start with the main sessions that are. First one is uh, using real world data to generate real world evidence unitology, and then the second uh, presentation is uh, development of treatments given to pregnant women for the benefit. Before we go further, uh, just a couple of high housekeeping items. I'm sure you've heard the, these before too. First one, this workshop is being recorded and uh, uh, all the recordings are going to be put on, on a link for you to view uh, within 24 hours. If you have any questions at all, please put them in the QA box below. Uh, On-demand materials are in the resources area. Uh, very important, just in an off chance that there is a platform outage and we're experiencing some technical difficulties with the Global Meet platform. We do have an alternative uh, a backup prepared in case something like this happens. We are going to be instantly sending you an email and please check out for that email if something like that happens. Finally, uh, we would appreciate if you would follow CPATH and Inc. on social media, on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and if you're going to be posting about uh, this particular meeting, we would appreciate if you use the hashtag Inc. 2020 in all of your mentions, and that'll basically just go more visible to the meeting. And up next, we're gonna start with the work group update, and the first one is data terminology update by Mike Petula. So I'm going to hand over the mic to, uh, the mic to Mike. Mike, uh, are you on? Uh, I'm on Connolly. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and I'm here today to um, provide an update on the work for the data and terminology work group. I'm a co-chair along with um, Dr. Roger Sol from the University of Vermont. Um, and these are work group members who've helped contribute um, on all of our uh, work to date. And uh, we appreciate everybody's participation. Um, so what I'd like to cover today is just to touch on some of the definitions we worked on um, in the demographic and maternal concepts um, and show you how to, they can be accessed. Um, also wanted to um, go over our sort of general approach and rationale for more granular data collection and walk through um, our GI um, necrotizing enterocolitis example um, and talk a little bit about how um, this sort of sets the foundation for uh, electronic um, data extraction um, relating to the topic next hour around real world data. Um, also wanted to touch on briefly about um, what else we need in addition to these definitions for guidance for those doing trials. Um, and we'll touch also on um, our future um, domains and also um, aims for collaboration. So um, currently published in the uh, NCI thesaurus um, are the established definitions for some demographic and maternal concepts along, which sit alongside the adverse event um, terminologies. Um, you, can, you can find this in the uh, NCIT and it was published by the uh, Enterprise Vocabulary Services. Um, our colleagues, um, Terry Quinn and Dr. George Chang have been very, um, helpful and supportive in this process, and, we, and we're grateful for that. If you, um, once you're into the NCI term browser, um, you can put in INC terminology um, and, and find different um, groupings. Um, if you can see on the right, we have um, the INC definitions, which sit alongside the, um, the NCI terms and definitions and codes. Um, and these can also be accessed via um, a hyperlink and, and reference that way. Uh, you can, and they also can be downloaded in spreadsheets for um, reference. So we hope folks will take advantage of that and we hope to um, sort of broaden um, the, the uh, collections of definitions that exist there. <clears throat> so for, um, in terms of our general approach, 
I really wanted to um, sort of explain um, why we've sort of uh, broken things down to this more granular um, data collection. And so as you, you all know well, uh, many of our outcomes of interest are really constructed from sets of criteria, um, different findings or observations. And um, they're important because they help us differentiate the, the concepts of interest from other similar concepts. Um, they also allow us to um, have staging and classification based on illness severity. Um, and these discrete sort of building blocks or criteria, if you will, really will allow us to test overlap from you know, more strict, rigorous definitions that might be used in a trial to those that might be part of the general surveillance definitions. Um, and another important component is these will allow definitions to evolve. So if you consider all the data collected for the BPD trials over the years and how those have, have um, changed slightly, um, it really makes it much more powerful in terms of our, our um, meta-analysis and data collection um, if, you, if you have the more detailed data. So when I mean, when I refer to differentiating similar concepts, we just want to make sure there are, um, um, you can have concepts which are similar but tough to differentiate, such as um, neck with pneumic peritoneum versus a spontaneous or idiopathic intestinal perforation. Um, and you also have to make sure that um, there are concepts that exist when um, someone, you know, will record a seizure. Are they talking about um, an encephaloelectrographic seizure or, or more of a, a, a clinical seizure-like episode? And so you have to ensure that there are concepts which are capturing precisely what, what is intended when that's, you know, documented or referred. Um, in terms of overlap, we also wanted to um, explore how de different definitions perform in a given cohort. So um, as I mentioned, you may have a research trial definition with very strict and sometimes more lengthy criteria. And you can, if you have the granular data, you can explore on how well um, that, you know, quality improvement or surveillance definition might also um, represent that cohort and how they may, um, you know, how um, similar they, they may be or, or they may not be. And, and that can be valuable information um, as, as we move forward, um, especially when we get to the real world data piece. So as we approached our uh, view of uh, the neck definitions, we took a look at the concepts that exist in Bell staging along those in, um, in the Vermont-Oxford network definition. And we started to uh, assemble a lot of these um, uh, concepts, if you would, um, and developed uh, specific definitions for um, just what was intended by those concepts. And in doing that, we, we've developed, you know, fairly simple but straightforward definitions around pneumoperitoneum um, and discrete concepts for radiographic, so X-ray findings of pneumatosis intestinalis versus those captured by ultrasound and, and other related concepts. Um, and these can sort of be used and assembled to um, you know, know your degree of certainty for um, the diagnosis of neck as well as um, different degrees of staging, which may relate to outcome. Um, we shared this with some members of the INC network group and, and got some um, nice feedback we're thankful for um, in terms of uh, adding concepts to differentiate possible versus definite pneumatosis, which makes, makes great sense, as well as capturing procedures. Um, and so we hope to do more work like this in, in different domains, and that's one of the areas we're looking for um, collaboration. Um, so to give an idea of of how this might um, exist. Um, we, we sort of have the main concept of interest and, and how it's described. And then we can look at some of these criteria, which, um, which may support um, the, these sort of diagnoses or um, uh, concepts. And you know, in this example, we're talking about neonatal opiate withdrawal syndrome. And so you might look for different criteria, you know, um, observations that contribute to Finnegan scoring or um, some sort of uh, drug screen uh, testing that helps support that diagnosis. And so you're really assembling these so that those data can be um, most um, useful. Um, and, and the one thing as sort of a preview to the next uh, hour's talks, um, I wanted to just um, present the concept of um, a, a new standard that's evolving in um, 
uh, in internationally for um, EHR extraction, electronic health record data. And um, that involves something called uh, fire resources. And briefly, it takes information that exists on health, health record and it, and it puts it on a server in an organized fashion where it's, you're organized by different resources for um, you know, condition, observations, et cetera. You merge that information with information that exists in reference terminologies, and that really allows um, provides this platform where um, it can be queried and um, used for a number of different um, uses from um, public health reporting, um, different registries, surveillance. So um, this is really the direction everything um, is, is widely going in the big scheme. And um, I just wanted to sort of introduce that concept as people are sort of saying and, and really saying the work we're doing to date um, is really providing a foundation for a lot of that um, work. So for example, if um, you know, you're trying to report Finnegan scoring, um, and there, there currently aren't um, uh, codes within LOINC, the reference terminologies, um, in order to uh, support that yet. Um, so um, there, and there are other gaps too, which should be addressed, but the, the fundamental work we're doing in terms of identifying these sort of important concepts of interest at the granular level will really, really provide um, a lot of important work in, in that area. Um, the other thing we really um, uh, would love um, work to, um, to collaborate with folks on is um, we, we hope to expand to other areas um, based on other, we'd love to collaborate with other work groups in terms of um, helping um, establish and, and uh, the definitions that of concepts of interest and, and, and have those available within the NCI thesaurus. Um, and we also recognize that it's really important that we have, um, um, in, the definitions are part of the piece, but it, independently it's, it's tough for folks to use them. And we think it would be really valuable to develop a reference guide where people could understand sort of, once you have the granular data, how you would apply these in, in sort of an algorithm or um, a component definitions and, and how that might differ uh, a bit for if you're dealing with it as a primary definition versus you know, just a secondary observation or, or a comorbidity of interest. Um, and so from, from that standpoint, we'd really appreciate um, participation from um, you know, pharmaceutical companies and other groups doing trials to get their feedback on what they would find to be most valuable, um, as well as uh, the subject matter expertise from the different work groups. It's really um, critical and vital that this be um, available for for um, uh, folks to do. So, um, and, and, and we um, very much welcome, so please reach out to uh, myself or, or, or Roger to, um, if you're interested in all in, in collaborating, because we, we greatly appreciate it. Um, and, and with that, I'd like to um, introduce uh, Dr. Janice Dion um, from the University of British Columbia, um, uh, who's the co-chair of the Hemodynamic Adaption Work Group. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm happy to be here um, representing my committee to give you a nice update about what we've been doing over the last year. We've been very productive in the Hemodynamic Adaptation Work Group. Um, and I'm co-chair along with Heike Rabe. Um, and we've got a great diverse um, representation on our committee. Um, and uh, our committee members are quite active. We get them doing a lot of the uh, background work, um, which has been uh, ongoing over a series of years. So we'll go back to the very beginning when we originally presented in July of 2016, and um, we presented a concept that we needed an international consensus on acceptable uh, acceptable blood pressure ranges for preterm and term newborns. Um, and we, the idea being that for future trials, um, whether we decide that blood pressure is a good marker or not um, for hypotension and hypertension, we need to start with appropriate norms. And at the moment, the norms or values that are out there 
our really diverse combination of infants that were sick or well, that needed blood pressure treatments or not, single center studies. So we really need a better norm so that we can go forward with um, an appropriate starting point for any future trials. So we decided to go through the literature and assess several aspects, looking at methods of measurement, um, looking at factors that would influence blood pressure, um, both from a high and low perspective, um, improve the normative data, and then do some validation of what we have. So our final questions at the end are, what are the observed ranges of blood pressure by gestational ages, weights, and postnatal age in babies who have not received any blood pressure modifying treatments? Um, what factors influence blood pressure and how? So we looked at maternal factors, perinatal factors, and infant factors. And what are the recommended um, meth blood pressure me measurement methods? And we kind of did this in the reverse order. So we decided that the first thing we needed to figure out was what we were going to accept as the most accurate blood pressure measurement methods because that would inform the rest of the analyses that we did. So this summer, we had our first uh, paper published in the Journal of Pediatrics on the proper method of blood pressure measurement in neonates and infants in a systematic review. And that's ended up being a really great um, article. We've, there's um, evidence for our recommendations um, and good uh, images to document the right way to measure blood pressure. So to summarize, for those who haven't um, seen it in general, we want MAP as opposed to systolic or diastolic is the most accurate. Uh, we want you to use a cuff size with a cuff width to arm circumference ratio of about 50%. Um, do it on the upper arm, not on the leg, um, do repeated measures to, before you decide on whether treatments are necessary because blood pressures can be variable. Um, and, um, and so we want to um, outline all of that as well as the areas where research is needed because in the lowest blood pressure ranges, oscillometric blood pressures just really don't uh, represent intraarterial values well. So, um, you know, we identified where more research was method uh, measures are needed. And we also put out a plea to improve the devices that we have available for neonates, because really, if we can improve the device accuracy, then maybe oscillometric will be much more appropriate in the majority of infants. So then we went on to looking at factors that influenced blood pressure, because again, this was going to inform our final analysis of uh, blood pressures. And so we also have an article ready for submission on summarizing antenatal and perinatal factors that influence neonatal blood pressure. Unfortunately, what we found was that there's limited information on this. Um, the studies were often either few in number or they were conflicting in the results. Um, and so again, we put out a plea that whenever uh, studies are being done on neonates uh, that involve blood pressure to also consider collecting antenatal and perinatal factors so that we can better figure out how these things influence um, neonatal blood pressures. We also think that studies of maternal health conditions and issues around the time of delivery should consider including neonatal blood pressure done in the proper method as an outcome marker so that in the other way, we can also get more information on how maternal diabetes, hypertension, um, chorioamnionitis, things like that also influence um, neonatal blood pressure um, because we really have very limited data on this at the moment. And then finally to the last question, which is really what I think most people on the committee joined the committee to help um, figure out, which is what are the observed ranges of blood pressure by gestational age, weight, postnatal age in babies who have not received any blood pressure modifying treatments. And um, this has been a lot of work. It's been extracting all of the blood pressure data out of 
many, many papers to try to get it together for the statisticians to analyze. Um, many of the work group members pulled information. We've had summer students as well and, and research students helping to pull it, trying to take out the infants who've had treatments or steroids or fluids or inotropes from the rest, um, trying to get a most pure population that we can so that we would know that blood pressures that have we're providing have had been associated with infants who have done well. And we are have gotten most of the information out and this is just some of the preliminary data, not even including all of the studies, but this was put together by one of the students. Um, and just an idea of what kind of things we're finding. So this is um, some tables of blood pressure according to gestational age. So this is increasing gestational age and this is the mean arterial pressure. And this first graph is all in the first hour of life. So the um, as the gestational age goes up, the expected mean blood pressure goes up. But interestingly, it seems to kind of plateau around term um, and doesn't seem to be much higher. Uh, the second graph is in the first 12 hours of life. And then the final graph is at the at 24 hours of life. And, and obviously there's some outlier studies, um, but it's very interesting, the pattern. And I'll show you next what was found according to birth weight. So again, this is increasing birth weight on the bottom, and this is mean arterial pressure on the side. And this are all the different study analyses. And again, as you can see, increasing birth weight, your expected mean arterial pressure increases in the top hardest first hour of life. But you see that here with birth weight, that doesn't seem to be a plateau. It would seem that the expected mean arterial pressure increases regardless without a plateau. And then again, the second graph is at 12 hours and, and the final graph at 24 hours. So just a taste of you know what we're finding and, and pulling out of the, the data. And we had a work group meeting yesterday, very productive. And a lot of the discussion is then around how are we going to consolidate this data? How are we going to organize it for presentation? Because it obviously needs to be complete and accurate, but it also needs to be uh, clinically important. So within the first 24 hours, how many times are you likely comparing the blood pressure and um, it sounds like for some of the smallest neonates, you're almost bedside sometimes watching. So more, more normative data for the first uh, period is probably most important. And then further out, how often do we think we need it, that it changes? And at some point we need to switch from, you know, gestational age at birth to probably postmenstrual age to try to decide what was the most user-friendly and is it going to be tables or graphs and, and how do we break it down by gestational age and birth weight. Um, so that's what we were working on and hopefully we'll be getting some new uh, data in the next few months. And then we talked about the future. So, you know, at the end of this, we're going to have a very good, very unique um, normative data set. Um, and so where do we go with this? Well. Obviously, we need to validate this and start looking at what is the meaning of it. So, you know, hearing about this amazing uh, data collection that's going to be coming in the future with the, the real world data, could we collaborate with this group and include blood pressure as some of the data points that are measured? And could we look at collection of some of the antenatal and perinatal factors that are so far undiagnosed and or not confirmed to have a specific influence up or down on the blood pressure. Could we correlate the blood pressure with outcome markers? So um, blood pressures with how good the urine output is, blood pressures with the serum pH of the infant, of urine glucosuria as a marker of how well the kidneys are working. Could we correlate this blood pressure values that we get with infant health and disease states? So 
what happens with a clinically significant PDA to the blood pressure. What is the effect on the blood pressure when the infants get uh, sepsis or rule out sepsis? So, so many potential applications once this uh, initial blood pressure data set is created and um, observed ranges are established. So I think the future is very exciting. There's, there's many, many ways we can go um, once we get this data set. And it has been um, a long and um, process and lots of hard work by all of the work group members to go through all of the papers and for each of these different topics, pulling out all of the blood pressure information and the statistician crunching all the numbers and comparing studies and and everything. So it's taken us a while. And, and I know sometimes um, there is a little bit of worry about what we were going to get to, but we're in um, a year where we've had tremendous growth and accomplishments in the group. Um, and the next step is going to be, I think, even more exciting uh, once we get this uh, data together. Um, and of course, all of this would not happen without the support of uh, Laura Butte. So thank you very much for her support of this group. She stuck with us for the last four years um, and kept us on task and we wouldn't be here without her. So thank you to her and the rest of the work group members. Um, and I think the next thing that we will have is a uh, short video about the INC. So I will leave it to the the um, wizard behind the curtain to get the video going. Thank you. I think of two words, quality and safety. I think those two terms are so important to a very vulnerable population. Babies need better medicines and I and C is where different stakeholder voices come together to forge innovation in newborn medicine. Safe, efficient, and compliant clinical trials for brighter futures. International Neonatal Consortium is, for me, an around-the-world collaboration. We bring together multi-stakeholders, including neonatologists, NICU nurses, parent advocates, regulators, and industry executives with one common cause developing new medications for preterm infants. I like INC as a symbol of harmonization. We are from different countries. We have different cultures. We speak different languages. Despite this, all of us are working for the future of newborn infants under harmonization. I chose community as my one word because I see the NICU as a unique environment unlike other research environments. Full engagement of the neonatal community in INC's work, mission, and culture will be the primary driver of INC's success. Outcomes are what tie us all together. Every one of us focuses on outcomes. I do especially for my 17-year-old daughter who was born 10 weeks early and for myself. I was born early too. We all join together on outcomes. My one word is heard. I joined INC a few years ago because I know that they are working to make sure the voice of every newborn is heard in every clinical trial design, implementation, and follow-up. And also, I'm a part of INC, so I can make sure that the NICU parent voice is also being heard. I would choose the word passion. Every member of the INC brings passion and their full commitment to better the lives of our neonates and their families. We all approach our work with a baby's health central to our efforts. Every milestone we reach affects more than just the neonates, but the lives of the family members as well.